So we started to look and I'm there looking and I see this line of people coming and people dancing and I'm like, and where is this lady? Can I see her? Can I see her? I didn't know that. I mean, I looked at them and I've never seen that kind of body movement in persons. It was just amazing. But then while everybody looked amazing, all of a sudden our eyes sort of started to be, almost be drawn towards a small lady, very small in stature, but she was just something that at one point I wonder if she was real because the type of movements that I saw her doing with her body, I, I touched my sister and said, what is, who is, is, is she real? And we were both wondering if she's real. The, 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 the sort of movement that went along with the drumming, the drumming with the movement, as I said, that is something that's a priceless experience. And that is why, I mean, I saw this when I was about 18, 19 years old. I know I'm so many more years older than that, but I still remember everything. And so this little lady came and you could see when I watched her and she sort of came and although the others around her were dancing, she sort of, oh, I was just drawn to her because she sort of by her movement and there was no doubt who was in charge of this group, who was a leader and she 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 they moved around in a circle and we followed her with our eyes and the people just at one point even though there were so many people gathered there was not a sound <laughs> Um, the film is, is about sort of the evolution of, of Humana from the perspective of both practitioners and those who use the form to express themselves, so dancers and, and musicians. Um, there are not, there, it's, it's, it's about that ostensibly, but what we do is we channel the spirit of Queen Imogene Kennedy who really is the centerpiece of this and also elevating the voice of this Kumina queen. Um, Jamaica has not seen another Kumina queen like her since she passed over 20 years ago. There have been others, but what I was really struck with when I learned about her story was her ability to, you know, communicate um, the, 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 the pieces of her practice that she was able to share the pieces of her ancestral practice that she was able to share so that others could learn and could be demystified. And um, in the same way that if you saw Kumana being performed by the National Dance Theater Company of Jamaica, you would learn more, even though um, it's a staged version of the practice, you would feel the spirituality embodied in that, in the movements, and you'd want to know more. And that's what Queenie did. Um, she also was a healer and touched a lot of, um, lives uh, had a lot of adopted children so she was just this wonderful figure um, and embodiment of you know African to me African spirituality motherhood and healing and ancestral wisdom um, so so the film is is channeling her spirit and also asking today you know where those sort of values and knowledge like where does that still live in Jamaican culture Well, I want to um, talk a little bit about the influence of um, Africa on um, Queenie's practice and kind of get a, a little bit of an explanation of what Mile is and this traveling that she did. Mile is spirit possession, um, but Mile also was a religion in the 19th century, informed it seems by, you know, Christian revivalism, 
which happened in the mid 19th century, which took Jamaica by storm. There were missionaries of all sorts in Jamaica. And as we all know, Jamaicans tend to be very highly spiritual people, individuals. So the, the former slaves then gravitated to these other forms that were being introduced, these religious forms. And then they had their African practices. Many of them um, came from the Congo or from the Congo, Angola, Central African region. Others came from West Africa, the Maroons, from what I understand, you know, some of them traced their ancestry to Ghana. There are other groups in Jamaica, other descendants of um, Guinea and other countries. And all of them came with those practices, but Mile itself um, was this name used for any kind of spirit, spirit possession. And in the Kumana practice, um, it refers to a particularly violent um, spirit possession, which seems like a state that Queenie would have um, inhabited at least three times in her life. Okay. Um, and not only was her mile very um, particularly ex intense, but she was known to travel. She spoke of traveling back to Africa during that state of possession, um, the second of which lasted for 21 days. So during 21 days, um, in a, a trance state, she's, she tells the story, um, fallen under a cotton tree, a silk cotton tree. She experienced um, Africa. We don't know what all she saw, but when she came back, she, she knew more of her ancestors. She could speak more of the language and she knew more of the songs that her ancestors had passed down. So if we talk some more um, about how now um, you visualize visualization happening in this film, mm -hmm. particularly in relation to this you know, spiritual experience, what you hope for. Sure. Um, so Queenie's story is very particular. We're still figuring out how to communicate that timeline that we just talked about without really having a timeline. Because to me, it's not linear. And also, um, the easiest way would have been to narrate that. But we, we have some of Queenie's voice and we don't want to intrude. So along with Queenie's voice, we want to show, you know, snippets of the spaces that she, she's been in, the spiritual spaces that she occupied, without having to explain all of the details of how she came to be the way she was. Um, so, you know, having her go into her first mile, um, knowing that, you know, she's moving, she's dancing maybe, and all of a sudden she's not with us anymore, visualizing um, the transcendence um, into another realm, um, visualizing the body as it starts to lose control and maybe is inhabited by another spirit. Um, looking at her face and, and sort of the um, ecstasy that she experienced when she would go into, into trance and which many people experience when they go into a state of mile. Um, those, those are elements that I think will help tell the story. So we started, I remember we were going back and forth and um, you wanted a, a darker kind of theme for the poster. And I wanted like purples and light blues and things. I think we came to a compromise um, where we have a poster which references both Afrofuturism and African print and um, modernism and um, just maybe retro in its um, in the in the look of the pattern. And then we have another poster which um, shows it in a silhouette. So we have these two and those are, those posters are really important as a guide for how we're gonna go forward with visualization. Um, and I think I also developed some um, concept sketches for both you and the um, editor at the time, um, Ina Sotirova to look at. 
And um, so we're going in between there. Um, some of the other things I've thought about are how to incorporate, um, you know, all this time I thought of it as being a digital animation. And sometimes, now I'm thinking, but this could be really fun as a stop motion, you know? And so it's, it's now to think about playing with all these things. Um, some of the things that we visualized were, um, you know, the, the way that the feet would move, how, how Queenie's feet would move in dance, in performance, and also how her eyes, because I also see these, you know, what happens with it, when the spirit connect happens, the eyes are surely um, responsive to that. Um, how they indicate how the rhythm of the music is going to change the state of mind. And also uh, we wanted to represent um, how the spirits. So we talked about, you know, we, we went back and forth on how to represent the spirits. At first, the shapes that appeared in the poster were meant to represent the spirits um, in various ways. And then um, you came up with this idea of, well, really honing on in on the, that glass of water that, you know, that was always there. So I don't know, tell me more about like how you envision water working. Water has symbolism in many um, Afro folkloric spiritual traditions. And so for obvious reasons, I mean, water is the, the vehicle that you know carried people physically from Africa to the New World, water is cleansing. Water is healing. Water is life, and so the water is always an, an integral part of um, the Kumana practice, even if it's just in a in a small glass um, next to the drummer's feet. Um, but that water, to me, is also a creative element because it refracts light. And um, it, it is um, a sort of a film between the conscious world and uh, the natural world, which is still full of sentient energy. Um, if you, you know, the other day I went to the famous Jamaican bath um, and we went at night and we stepped into this sort of lagoon area covered with the canopy of a forest and the water was green and blue and silver. Um, it was hot and cold. It was um, dripping down through bamboo onto our bodies. It was, it was extremely um, surreal and spiritual to be in, in water in such a mystical natural environment. And so I imagine that water um, in our memory connects us to our, spir our spiritual um, understanding. It connects us to our ancestors. And um, it's just a way for us to, being in water and being around water is a way for us to um, connect with ourselves yeah. and to leave this, this um, conscious state of being. Yeah, so that was the thing, you know, you, you just described this really visual experience that you have and how you look at the water. Um, and that's interesting. Um, for me, I always saw that glass of water as, even if water itself is important for like any ritual or anything like that, uh, I saw it as this very performative aspect of Jamaican culture, just mm -hmm. innately like the the spectacle um in a way which makes the performance magnificent in a way because without the water then you don't realize how adept this person is at what they're doing even while in this trance state there's like awareness and um unconsciousness at the same time as you're saying this person is able to manage balance of a glass of water on their head um, even 
while also being in communication with the spirits. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, I mean, balancing a glass of water on a good day is <laughs> difficult. <laughs> um, so um, while wheeling around and dancing, exactly at, knows how fast. Exactly, exactly. I guess I want to finish off by talking about ani- the role of animation. Mm-hmm. I think you said, oh, well, animation might be something appropriate for the film. I wanted to just find out when you felt that animation could work and why animation as a medium was mm-hmm. particularly appropriate. I, I began to understand animation as more than, you know, I understand animation as art first because I've been involved with workshops with young people making the most basic types of animation. But then um, the animation that we're exposed to maybe in Afrofuturist type films, for example, is very enhanced, you know, and very elaborate. And I hadn't seen that as being appropriate to the film. When we started to talk about it, I realized that you would bring this artistic sensibility to the, to the creation of the sequences and that it wouldn't be just animation out there in some way that didn't relate to the film or didn't or, or added too much, you know, or took away from the sort of natural, organic, documentary, um, archival style of the film. And when I realized that that was possible, I then, with other persons who are involved creatively with the film, realized that we needed to give ourselves creative license to try this, um, considering the limitations of the archive, considering the little that we really know about Queenie's thoughts and state of mind, considering that this is something that dances between, you know, historical and surreal. So how do you, how do you communicate um, uh, a story that's authentic and conveys an experience, but as you said, is not only Queenie's experience, but what we're really trying to do is create a world that people can understand, that we, we can understand ourselves. And so we really have to give ourselves, I had to give myself creative license to do that. It's not, um, a typical documentary. We don't, we have to recreate some of the things that we've learned about but have no evidence for. And so I think that this is a really appropriate um, medium for that. Yeah, yeah. I I think, um, I think that sums it up well. (laughs) 